right in my face. Well, I, I have to say, I, I can't remember saying that, but I'm sure that I did because I'm always teasing people. I like to tease people. Um, I am passionate about literature. I do take it seriously. But when I compare my passion to other writers' passion, it seems like a lesser passion. And I think I have an explanation for that. I mean, first of all, I think it's bad to be consumed by something. To have, pa to have literature as the only thing that's important in your life and to ignore everything else. So yes, I am passionate about literature, but I'm also passionate about politics, I'm passionate about music, I'm passionate about gardening, I'm passionate about the wildlife, I'm passionate about walking and about the countryside. So it's one of my passions, it's not an all-consuming passion. But I think there's a second thing that needs saying, really. That in England, and in, not so much in the rest of Europe, but certainly in England, there's a, there's a, a tradition of writing which has developed in the last um, 100 years, I guess, which is autobiographical writing, in which a writer will say, the best thing you must write about is your own life, your own experience, your own marriages. So if you've been married three times, you write about divorce and, uh, and, uh, and adultery and such thing. If you're a university professor, you write about universities. But my life is not the kind of life that lends itself to that kind of literature. You know, literature loves uh, disease. It doesn't like good health. Good novels like death, they don't like long life. Good novels like war, they don't like peace. Novels want to concentrate on the dark sides of humanity, because those are the things that, that, that are interesting. So when you look at my life, and ask, if I, for example, were to go into my publisher and say, guess what, I'm going to write an autobiographical novel. They say, oh great, what's it about? And I'd say, well, it's about a happy childhood, a long marriage, having children that I love and have done well, and everyone will fall asleep. Nobody wants to read that novel in which everything goes well. Literature does not like a happy story. Literature, good luck, you've heard the phrase before, I'm sure. Um, good fortune, good luck, writes white. It leaves white marks on the page. So I couldn't be an autobiographical writer. I had to be a different kind of writer. The kind of writer I am is an old-fashioned traditional writer. The kind of writer who doesn't put himself at the centre of the book but um, is much more concerned with communities and, and interpreting the life, the life of the community in which you live from the outside rather than from the inside. So here's the thing about passion. If you're an autobiographical writer, your subject matter is yourself. And so when you leave your office at night, your subject matter goes with you. When you walk the dog, your subject matter goes with you. When you're in the pub that night, your subject matter goes with you. And so of course you're passionate about literature, because being passionate about literature is the same as being passionate about yourself. But I'm different. Because I'm not an autobiographical writer, when I leave my office at 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, my subject matter doesn't come with me. My subject matter isn't myself. I leave it in the office. I leave it there. And therefore I count myself as lucky. I'm passionate about literature when I'm writing, but when I'm not writing, I'm passionate about life. And I don't let the two things mix. Well, here's the thing, you mentioned a novel, actually, which is my most autobiographical, because I have been a political activist all of my life, a political activist on the left. And, um, and I get more left-wing as I get older. I know that, that goes against the trend. In England, most people start off as left-wing, and by the time they're 50, you know, they're, they're raging right-wingers, and then they die as racists and homophobes and, um, and sexists. But for some reason or other, I haven't inherited those genes. But what has frustrated me uh, in politics um, is the English lack of passion about politics. In England, you know, it's a strange thing, unlike anywhere else in the world. If, you, for example, you had a collection of writers sitting around discussing, English writers, if anyone was too serious for too long, that would be considered ill-mannered. It would be considered a faux pas, and someone would interrupt with a joke or with an anecdote. Because in England, it's considered to be ill-mannered, to be too intellectual. There's a kind of an anti-intellectual tradition in England. Whereas anywhere else in the world, if you were at a group of writers and someone was being serious and you interrupted with a joke, it would be you who would be thought to be ill-mannered and, and inappropriate. 
So there's this anti-intellectualism in England. And the other side of this anti-intellectualism is a kind of hostility towards politics. And I hate that, and I love it at the same time. I wish that we had more political passion and turned out on the streets as they're doing at this very moment in Libya and changing the world. But English people are too polite. They're too obsessed with the protocols of, of not making a fuss. How many times have I done this myself? You know, when I've been at a dinner party and there's been some appalling old racist, for example, at the table, making racist remarks about immigrants or what have you. And we English, we never say anything. We let them get away with it because we're embarrassed about making a fuss. So, there, for me, there's this tension between the passion of politics and the bourgeois liberalism of England. And I've been very interested to know which I prefer. Uh, and that's what this last book was about, actually, to try and find an answer to that question. I loved being a journalist. I really enjoy it. I'm, I missed it. As a, as a novelist, I don't have any colleagues. Um, of course, coming to the Jaipur Festival is fantastic because you're surrounded by people that, you know, you can talk about books and you can have fun and you can drink. But that's not the everyday life of a writer. Um, the, my everyday life is that my wife goes off to work in the morning and I spend a whole day by myself. And, I, and I'm 65 years old now and I've been doing that for many, many years. And um, it's quite testing. When I was a journalist, however, I had colleagues. I always travelled with a photographer. I would always be talking to people. There was always editors to talk with. So I missed that. What journalism taught me, however, and when I left journalism, I'll explain why I left journalism in a minute, is that every word has to count. I remember that I would be asked to write 1,200 words, say, on a particular subject. And I would write 1,400 words. And the editor would come along with his big blue pencil, and he would take away 200 words, and they were always the words I loved best. They were my jokes, or they were my anecdotes, or they were my best metaphors. And he would always take away the ones you love best. And the only way round that would be to, to, if you're asked to write 1,200 words, only write 1,200 words and make every word count. And I've, I've taken that same thing into, into writing books. You'll notice that my books are very short, and that's because I try and make every sentence heavy with meaning rather than making, writing light sentences and writing uh, books of six or seven hundred pages. The reason I left the wonderful profession of journalism, and I think journalism really matters, I think journalism is so much more important than literature. And the reason I think that is that when I look around in England, I go on the train and I see people reading my books, I know exactly what kind of their, what their politics are. I know what they eat for dinner. I know where they go on holidays because they're people like me. And so basically my novels are read by people who agree with me. But when I was a journalist, I ended up being a journalist for the Sunday Times, a freelance on a freelance basis. My articles were read by millions of people. And probably only a tiny percentage of those articles, uh, of those readers, would share my politics. So the great thing about journalism is you are preaching to people who don't agree with you. And you, you have the possibility of affecting people's opinions and changing their minds. So that's why I think journalism, good free journalism, is more important than literature. However, um, back in 1986, I had a falling out with the, uh, an editor of a magazine who spiked one of my stories for political reasons. And I had no choice. I had to refuse to work for the magazine again. And as that magazine was the magazine, it was the Sunday Times magazine, as that magazine was my chief source of income, suddenly my, uh, my income disappeared and I had to start writing novels. That was in 1986. Well, I feel an antipathy towards uh, uh, emails and, and uh, uh, all new technology, but I also love it. So it's this, you know, that's why it's interesting. It's not, it's not an easy thing, like being against disease. It's one of those strange mixtures where you love things and you hate things. You know, what I've discovered about the world, I think, um, in the, uh, over the years, is that, is that everything new that is worth having is paid for by the loss of something old worth keeping. So everything that, everything, everything that comes along that you love, you have to lose something else that you love. And that's just the, that's just the shape of the universe, that's just the, sh the way things are. 
So with email, you know, let's think, when I was a kid, before any of the modern technology came along, if you wanted to make a phone call, um, I would have to leave the flat that I lived in in North London and I'd have to walk up the road and I'd have to stand in a queue of my neighbours and wait at the phone port box, having a conversation, meeting people, being sociable and then make my phone call and then have another conversation and then go home. So. I met, I met people, I made contact with people, I had two long walks. That's what making a public phone call meant in those days. These days now, we've all got private things. We don't interact with each other. And that's the trouble with the email. It's incredibly convenient, it's wonderfully quick, it's a joy, but it's against nature and it's against, it's against society. And so that's another ambiguity which I'm in currently thinking about and enjoying at the moment.